taking. And you know, like uh, in the beginning, we can see central forces uh, standing as mute spectators when houses were burned. You know, people are running together, like uh, out of the villages. Okay. And we could see from the footages, the video footages, that there were people, there were people who were using the sophisticated weapons like AK-47 and 56, and they participated in the rail. Uh, there is admittedly 996 illegal immigrant villages. So 996 villages, how many homes they will have, how many families, and the families will have how many uh, members. So you can imagine like it will be, uh, you know, Jalangam of my ancestor is not beyond dreams to realize it is within our grips. The day is not far off when the victims, sorry, the visions of Jalangam, the uh, flag of Jalangam is hoisted permanently in our land. Here all the Meitei homes can be seen like, you know, thriving and living together and all surrounded by uh, the houses of people belonging to the Kuki communities. Now we see the encircled place. This is of May 2023 when the crisis happened. All right. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you both in our uh, channel. And uh, we have always raised the, the issue with the Manipur and we are very glad to have both of you who knows the ground reality in Manipur with us today. And we are looking forward to a very, uh, a very enlightening session. Uh, Vidyaji, you can start with the introduction and then we will take it from there. Yeah. Uh, namaste, a very warm welcome to one and all. Today, we are privileged to have with us two important speakers who are joining us for the first time on this platform of Satyamev Jayate. Please welcome Advocate Geeta Rani Takhel Lambam and Sri Nabakishor Singha Yunnam, spokesperson for the World Maitai Council. Going ahead with the introductions, let me start with Srimati Geeta Rani Ji. Geeta Ji, who is originally from Imphal, Manipur, has done her Bachelor of Law from Delhi University, as well as her QLTT, that is Qualified Lawyers, transfer test from the UK, a distinguished advocate with a legacy of excellence and a qualified solicitor from UK, Geeta Ji's fields of expertise include corporate governance, risk management, legal advisory, legal compliance, contract drafting and negotiation, arbitration and litigation in an illustrious career spanning over 25 years. She has been a trusted legal advisor as well as a legal head to several prominent corporate companies. Geeta Ji, who is also the founder of GRT, Legal and Associates in Imphal, is a force to be reckoned with. A trailblazer in her field, Geeta Rani Ji's journey from Delhi University's Campus Law Center to being a qualified solicitor from the UK reflects her unwavering commitment to her career. Currently based out of Pune, Maharashtra, Geeta Ji's diverse experiences bring forth a remarkable profile deep-rooted both in knowledge and dedication. We are indeed fortunate to have you amongst us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Going ahead with our second speaker, Sri Nabakishore Singha Yunnam. Nabakishore Ji, who hails from Silchar, Assam, is a postgraduate in electronics, acquiring his master's from Gauhati University. He went on to do his EMBA in marketing from Manipal University, as well as MA in political science through IGNOW, and finally, project management professional certification from PMI, USA. After having over 22 years of a career in mobile telecommunications domain, including MNCs like Nokia, Ericsson, and finally Vodafone, which he quit recently, Nabakishorji turned towards entrepreneurship and also got into social activism. Currently, along with being the spokesperson of the World Maitai Council, WMC, he is also the president of its Assam State Unit. Since the WMC is a unit of the Global Maitai Foundation, which is a registered organization under company section eight. Nabakishorji also holds the position as a director of this organization. Thank you so much for joining us on this platform of Satyamiva JT, Nabakishorji. It is an honor to have both of you joining us today. We look forward to a very riveting and an eye-opening discussion. Thank you so much once again for joining us. The, uh, we, the space is yours and over to you, Del Shempo. Thank you. Uh, as discussed, actually, we will go with one by one. And once the presentation is over, let me know. I will open it up for questions. So go ahead.
Thank you, Ravi Sankarji. I'll uh, start the uh, Vikishwaji Namaskar. And uh, I want to thank you, first of all, uh, Ravi Sankarji and Vidya Ji for this opportunity to be uh, you know, here in the program, for giving us this space. So actually, uh, this crisis uh, has lots of issues. It's like uh, it has layers and layers. So for better understanding this, I have uh, prepared a PPT and I would like to present uh, my, you know, like speech through a presentation. So if you can just allow me to, you know, share my screen, I'll start. Uh, Go ahead. With so here, uh, I want to start with a brief uh, background. Today's topic is Manipur violence, the plight of Maitais. So like to give a historical background, we Maitais or like Manipur itself has a written history of more than 2000 years back. We have a very rich tradition and culture, which we are very proud of. And uh, Maitais, they form around 43% uh, roughly of the total population of Manipur, according to the 2011 census. And uh, as regards religion, we are mostly Hindus. So uh, one interesting fact is uh, Manipur, we have our own, uh, we, before the, you know, like uh, Indian constitution was adopted, in Manipur, we had our own constitution that uh, that was given by the Maharaja Bodhachandra of that time, uh, Manipur Constitution Act 1947, it was enacted. And then we had our first Manipur State Assembly by adult franchise, universal adult franchise, both uh, male, female of all adult age, they voted. An assembly was, uh, you know, enacted and uh, this was in the year July 1948. So this is the first election uh, in India, actually. And in this election, the general category, Hills and Muslims were represented in the ratio of 30 is to 18 to is to 8. And uh, Moirang Koirang became the first chief minister of Manipur. After this, exactly about one year later, on 21st September 1949, actually yesterday we observed the anniversary of this, the then Maharaja Bodhachandra, he signed a merger agreement and Manipur was merged into the Indian constitution, uh, into the Indian Union on 15th October 1949, effectively, as a part C state. Now, uh, Ravi Sankarji and Vidyaji, there is a whole history. <laughs> In fact, we can have a talk separately for this. How uh, Manipur was merged and it was like made into a part C state where it was administered through a uh, centrally appointed commissioner, and it was given full statehood only in the year 1972. So all these dissatisfactions and the history behind this, we saw between 1949 and 1972, starting especially from the 1960s, insurgency movement developed in a big way in Manipur. So in this, with this background, I'll just introduce uh, the map of Manipur. But before showing you the map, I just want to give a background. We Maitais are confined to the valley. Manipur is like surrounded by hills and there is a valley uh, in the middle of it, which comprises about 10%. And of that 10%, taking away the Loktak Lake and the reserve forest areas, there are about 6% livable areas. And in this 6% area, everybody has the right to buy and stay. So like, uh, this is the place where Maitis are confined mostly. And Maitis have no right to buy land in the hills, uh, especially after the MLR Act 1960. And, uh, you know, from the valley also, when the land is owned by an ST, there are restrictions of buying this land back from the ST. Uh, this is because of Article 371C and MLR and LR Act. There has been a movement of amending, amending this act, which, you know, during the crisis, it has come up, but it hasn't happened yet. And thirdly, from this map, I wanted to point out is the national highways, the two important national highways, which connects Manipur with the outside, uh, you know, like other states of India. These are in control of the hill tribes because they pass through the hills. And during normal times, extortion through collection of illegal tax is the norm. And during abnormal time, that is when they have certain demands or certain, you know, like uh, problems, total blockade can be seen of both these highways. So it's like the valley is chalked off, like, you know, you are 
not having any connection with the outside world if both these highways are you know blocked this is the situation of uh, people living in the valley and uh, every time like scarcity of essential items is becoming a kind of you know, accepted thing for the people in the valley now coming to the map i'll just show you this is the imphal valley excuse me this yeah this is the imphal valley and here the hills are surrounding it in the northernmost uh, portion the naga tribes mostly resides certain portion that kuki communities several tribes which are uh, like uh, tried to be brought in into the umbrella term of kuki they are residing in this southern portion and in the jili bam recently if you have heard their crisis uh, earlier it was like relatively peaceful but crisis has started in the western portion of uh, manipur this is the jili bam here from jili bam this national highway 37 passes through and uh, national highway number 2 also passes from the north which connects us with nagaland and this national highway 37 connects us with assam so once these two national highways are blocked manipur actually uh, you know mrp of uh, items available in manipur much higher than those you know in the other parts of the country because of this factor what goes through when this essential items this commodity passes through the highways i'll come to that at later so this is the situation uh, in which the valley people that is the maitis are living in confined in this area surrounded by the hills now coming back to the crisis i'll just give briefly uh, give through this slide how it started actually the misconception was this crisis started from may 3rd because of the peace rally organized by the tribals against the high court uh, order of uh, st demand by the maitis but i i have said like uh, in this slide also that it is a misconception why because uh, between april 26 to 29 2023 we already saw problems starting in jorjanpur for example the open gym which was supposed to be inaugurated by the honorable chief minister it was vandalized and the forest range office was burnt and that was much before may 3rd then only the problem had started and uh, why these issues this problem had started was because of this high court order the, everybody is blaming this high court order but i'll just briefly give you the background of this high court order uh the st demand committee of the maitis had submitted an application to the government of india asking maitis to be included in the list of scheduled tribe that was as far back as in 2020 2013 so like around 11 years back and the travel ministry travel affairs ministry had sent a letter back to the government of manipur asking the government to give ethnography and socio economic report from a reputed organization that was in again in 2013 but the government of manipur did not act did not send any report so stdmc approached the high court and high court merely gave an uh, order saying that government of manipur should give this recommendation that's all high court never said st status should be given to maitis but the order was interpreted in such a way that you know high court has granted st status to maitis and all this misinformation and misinterpretation led to this uh, you know using this order as an excuse to start a crisis so uh, tribal solidarity march was held on may 3 2023 and one interesting fact which came up was before may 3 before the rally the presence of international and national media was found in chochanpur and i believe uh, it was like they came because uh they heard something big was going to happen so this was the background and uh i don't know if this is visible clearly but we have given a chronology of the events so in more the rally started at 9:24 am so charpu it started at 11 and it was not a peaceful rally at all because at 11:26 we saw the burning of forest bit office and 1149 the 
Maite driver was beaten up. He was a, a truck driver. He was passing through. Uh, and then the rally was going on the side. He was taken down from the truck and beaten up. And 130 at Sadar Hills, Khadav Cultural Festival, that gate was torn down and then burned along with an image of the CM. And 215 p.m. and of the same day, the Anglo Cookie War Sanitary Gate was reportedly burned down by some miscreants. You know, two, three tires were burning. And uh, the allegation was that Maitais have come to Chorchanpur and burned this centenary gate you know, through, by burning these two, three tires. So using that excuse, violence started. We, like we can see videos of mobs gathering around the village and especially the Torung area around 3.32 p.m. it started. And uh, from there, like we can see videos where there were stone peltings and police intervened with tear gas. Like this, it, the problem actually started in the afternoon of May 3rd in Chochanpur. Now, by the time, you know, like uh, it reached same time in More also, we saw that, uh, you know, violence started. It was not a peaceful rally. Now, at 6.50 a.m. in Imphal, the misconception people have was, the problem started at Imphal. But when you see the timeline, the problem at Imphal started only in the late evening. 6.50 p.m., people started gathering uh, at Chekon and Imphal. And they started discussing about the problems because nowadays people, uh, everybody has eyes because of their mobiles, the videos, and everything gets circulated very fast. So news reached Imphal of all the violence happening. And evening, you know, like... At 6.50, Imphal got affected. And 6.54, more violence began. So at around 7.30, Assam Rifles, it failed to control the mob at More and totally like burning down of houses and everything happened at More at this time. Now at around 8 p.m. in New Checkpoint Imphal, the mobs, Maite mobs started retaliating. And then, you know, fourth and fifth was very horrible and uh, state officials, the Security forces, both central and state, they could not control and it went, you know, they spiraled. So as an aftermath of the crisis, the few days of the crisis, so total shifting of population from Imphal to Chorchanpur and Kangkopi, like, and from Chorchanpur to uh, Imphal, wherever Maitis were there outside, they all were shifted back and uh, put in relief camps. And likewise, People belonging to the Kuki community were shifted out of Imphal to other areas. So six, more than 60,000 people got displaced from their homes and they're now staying in camps in horrible conditions. Still, there's no uh, you know, rehabilitation going on. Process was on, but then again, the violence started as we all know, September beginning. And we saw more than 200 deaths. So uh, one fallout was total ethnic cleansing of Maitis from Moray to Chanpu and Kangkopi. When I said shifting of population, why I mentioned only ethnic cleansing of Maitis from Moray to Chanpu and Kangkopi is because from there, total wipeout of any sign of Maitis having stayed there, that happened. Whereas the cookie homes in Imphal, they were vandalized, some of them, but Nothing like total burning down, raising down them to the ground or bulldozing them or not reducing them to plain clothes. That did not happen. That hasn't happened. It will not happen. Whereas it's the opposite uh, for the Maitai houses in More, Chochanpur, and Kampo. Now, another fallout of the crisis we saw was buffer zones has been erected around Imphal Valley. So first you shift the population. Now there's Kuki areas, Maitai areas, and you have a buffer zones where you can cross each other, like international boundary type have been created. And the central security forces are manning those buffer zones. Now, a few days later after the crisis started, that is on May 12th, exactly 10 days later, the 10 Kuki Joe MLAs, they issued a joint demand for separate administration. You know, we are separated by uh, mentally, emotionally, physically separated. Uh, we cannot survive living together with the Maitais. We want to have a separate state or separate union territory. That demand has came quite promptly 
you know, like as if it was prepared from before, it was jointly by all the 10 Kuki Jo MLAs, which were from different parties, but they were united in demanding this. Now, I mentioned ethnic cleansing of Maites from Chochanpur and two other districts. So as an example, I want to show three timeline photographs of one Maite colony, that is Kumu Jambalekai of Chochanpur. Uh, there are five colony, more than five colony actually, but main five colonies in which we see similar pattern. So this is a Google image of November 2022. In this, you know, this brown portion is the Kumu Jambalekai. Here, all the Meitei homes can be seen, like, you know, thriving and living together and all surrounded by uh, the houses of people belonging to the Kuki communities. Now we see the encircled place. This is of May 2023 when the crisis happened. Here you can see instead of houses, rubbles are there, debris are there. So all the houses have been destroyed. They've been burned and razed to the ground. Now, what is the current situation of today, of this place? Here is the portion encircled by red. And you will see even the debris has been cleared out. It's totally plain plots now. And in the news, it came like, you know, like there's a Supreme Court order asking there should be no encroachment, there should be protection of these plots and all that. But uh, we saw news coming that people were trying to encroach. There were fight between cookies and Mar tribes who will be controlling these plots. And there were even attempts to set, set up markets on this place. So these things are happening. And uh, it's not just population shifting. The whole identity, the existent, very existence of Maitais in this lake, guys, have been, this colony has been wiped out. That's why I used to term uh, ethnic cleansing of Maitais very seriously. Now, uh, coming back to the crisis, some issues have cropped up, some topics for discussion have cropped up during this crisis. One very important is suspension of operation agreement, SUE as we called it. So what is this SUE? It is actually uh, started by negotiation with Assam Rifles and the Kuki militants, and they signed between themselves in the year 2025, uh, sorry, 2005, uh, only between Assam Rifles and Kuki Milit. And when I say Assam Rifle, of course, it represents the central government. And it is supposed to be suspension of operation. But you'll be surprised to know that there was never an operation between Assam Rifles and Kuki Milit, or security forces and Kuki Militants. There was not even a firing of a bullet between the two parties, but still uh, agreement was signed, naming it as suspension of operation agreement. And after negotiation in 2008, it was made a tripartite agreement with the state government, Manipur state government, uh, becoming a party to it now. There were two main groups in this Kuki militant group, Keno, which has 11 subgroups, and UPF, United People's Front, with five subgroups. Total 2,181 cadres, with small, small groups, you know, some group have even 13 members, 14 and 20 cutters. So these were all grouped together under the SUE agreement. And 14 designated camps were established for these uh, militant groups, SUE groups, and it was designated surrounding the valley. I'll show you a picture of that uh, just to give an idea. And one point I want to bring out about the SUE agreement was these militant leaders, they have either Myanmar origins or connections, and also they have a very close political connections. So next slide, I'm showing you this is the camps. This is in the middle, you can see the plain area. That is the Valley Impal Valley. And surrounding this, these are the camps, designated camps of these Sioux militants. Next to that, we have Assam rifle camps. And uh, Opi cultivation issue is there. Uh, I'll be coming to that later. But these camps and the Popi cultivation, where the you know Popi cultivation takes place, they are very near and close to each other. And it is the perception, is the allegation of people that these Sioux militants, they are protecting the Popi cultivation. They are also involved in it. So how far that is true, that will be subject to investigation. And the present matter is under NIA and the 
of course, uh, Lamba Commission is taking up the investigation. This is also one of the allegations. Now, I'm showing this slide, which shows the connection of the uh, Kuki militant leaders with Myanmar and the close political connection. The first person is Mr. Thalian Pao Guite. He is the uh, Jomi Revolutionary Army President. And admittedly, he is the ex-MP candidate in the Chin state of Myanmar. He stood for election uh, for MP in the Chin state of Myanmar. He has even stated this in an interview with a TV uh, program. Next, we have Mr. Kem Chin, the President comes Secretary of Jomi Revolutionary Army. He is also from Chin state of Myanmar. Now, third person, we have this uh, Mr. P.S. Haukip. He is the present chairman of the Kuki National Army. He is of Burmese origin and he's sheltered at Nagaland. And we have Mr. David Hangsheng, the present president of Kuki Revolutionary Army. He is also of Burmese origin. And interestingly, he's also the husband of Mr. Kim Nyo Hokip Hang Singh, the sitting MLA of Cycle Assembly, constituency of Manipur. Then last is Mr. Thangboy Kipgen, the present chairman of the Kuki National Front, KNF, and United People's Front, UPF. He is the husband of Mr. Nemcha Kipkin, the present Commerce, Ministry of Commerce and Industry and Cooperation of Manipur. So you can see the connection, you know, like very close connection of Myanmar and the political, uh, you know, like power at uh, presently in the Assembly of Manipur. Now, uh, we have been demanding for abrogation of the Sioux uh, Agreement, and even the state government has withdrawn its support. Now it is only the center and uh, the cookie militant groups. Why we are demanding for abrogation of Sioux is because we believe that all the terms and agreements of the uh, Sioux agreement has been violated by the militants. So I'll just concentrate on the points where they have violated, what they were supposed to abide by, and whether you know we can arrive at a uh, conclusion whether they have violated or not. The first is the preamble of the agreement itself. It mentions that you have to abide by the Constitution of India, the laws of the land, and the territorial integrity of Manipur. Now, we believe they have violated all these conditions. Constitution of India, laws of the land also, when they resort to extortion, killing of people, and territorial integrity of Manipur because they want to break Manipur and uh, you know, have a territory of their own as an union territory, or as a separate administration, or as a separate sovereign country, depending on the forum their demand changes, and I'll come to that later. Now, the second condition of the preamble is, they will completely abjure the path of violence and will not engage in violent or unlawful activities like killing, injuries, kidnapping, ambush, extortion, intimidation, carrying of arms in public, imposing of fines or taxes. Now, unless, you know, you can claim that the cookie militants under the Sioux Agreement are not involved in the present crisis. If you can prove that, then it's fine. But if these cookie militants under the Sioux terms, so under the Sioux Agreement, they're involved in the crisis, then obviously all these conditions have been valid. There have been rampant killings, kidnappings, and imposing of tax, I'll deal, they'll deal that separately. This has been happening from day one. Now, coming to the next slide. These are uh, Carter's conduct, code of conduct. This is not very clear, so I have given in a bullet point in the next slide. What the Carter's should be doing during the agreement was, they will not acquire additional arms and ammunition, which has been obviously uh, not observed, and carrying out fresh recruitment of Carter's. This, uh, as I mentioned earlier, at the time of uh, joining the Sioux Agreement, there were 2,000 odd uh, carters. And at that time, 2005, even if they were 18 years old, they'll be now in either you know, 37 or in the age age wise, they'll be 37 or above 40s, 50s. But we see young faces wearing these cookie militant uniforms, brandishing arms. So, prima facie, it appears that there are fresh recruitments. And thirdly, they are not supposed to take offensive actions like ambush rates, causing deaths. Again, this is as was in the preamble, uh, damage of property, loss and protection against public death, 
if they prove they are not involved in the crisis, that's something else. But if they are involved, if they are not inside their camp, supposed to be inside their camp, but if they are coming out and, and participating in the crisis, all these conditions have been violated. They're not supposed to construct memorial, hoist flags, carry out pedals of armed carders, and they can only celebrate their raising day inside the camps. But we, like, we have seen enough videos where they have a memorial hall, they have been hoisting flag with the Star of David in between, and they have been carrying out parades with sophisticated arms, which uh, one of their uh, lady representative claimed to be toys, toys ones, like, you know, as if that can fool the people. And then uh, next, they are not supposed to involve in road blockage, or surface communication. This is, I mean, like this condition has been violated uh, since day one. They are not supposed to move in uniform without arms in public. Videos and uh, images coming out shows that this has been violated. And support or have nexus with any militant group or a bad forming of new groups. They are not supposed to do this. See, now uh, in the beginning 2008, when the agreement was signed, there were around 16, 16 odd subgroups. Now I believe that there are 25 of them. So how the groups can be increased without their support and nexus? This again, you know, by itself it proves. So that's why I say all these seven conditions which were laid out as laid down as conduct to be uh, you know observed by the carders, these this have been violated by uh, the Sioux militants, each and every one of them. Now coming to the next slide. This is representative of some receipts, illegal tax receipts. The militants have been collecting taxes in the national highway and they blatantly issue tax, like, you know, and it's not small amount. You can see 15,000, 50,000, 60,000, 21,000, 40,000, 50,000. So all the trucks passing through the highways, they have to give these taxes. They, they can pass through only by giving these taxes. And uh, Mr. P.S. Haukip, in an interview, he was asked why you are collecting taxes and fine. And he was like openly saying in a TV interview that without these taxes, how we will be procuring arms, how we will survive. It? Because they are given a stipend of 6,000 per month, each of them. And because they cannot survive with this 6,000, because they have no other means of income, apparently. They do all, they are only militants and they remain as militants. And to survive as a militant, they cannot survive by the 6,000, so they have to collect the taxes, illegal taxes. This is the reasoning. And I don't believe that this is done, you know, secretly or without the knowledge of the security forces. In fact, uh, the spokesperson of Kokomi and uh, IPSA, Mr. Athoba Kurizam, in an TV interview, he mentioned when he asked the security, you know, personnel near the tax collection point of this Kuki militants, they answered it, they cannot survive on the, uh, you know, pension given, so they have to collect these taxes. So it's like uh, taken as granted and accepted by the authorities, and in the knowledge of all the authorities, state and central, that these Kuki militants are collecting illegal taxes. And, you know, ultimately, this taxes collection it falls down to the common people. They have to pay more for the essential goods. So the MRP in Imphal town, it's much, much more than you know, of the goods available in other parts of India. This is why it's happening. So you fund the pension amount of this cookie militants from your tax money, and then plus you pay all these illegal taxes also. This is the situation. Now, another idea which came up uh, with these Sioux militants is the idea of Jalengam. They call it Joland also, Kukilen also, and Jogam, I believe is also another name. This is a separate sovereign country of the Kuki people. Now, this is also controversy who all will fall into Kuki groups. They call it Kuki, Chin, uh, Mar, Jomi. So different, you know, under this umbrella of Kuki groups, they have try to bring in as many tribes as possible. This is like, uh, we can see some falling apart, of course, but we'll not deal with that. So uh, this idea of Jalengam, we can see uh, that this was formalized in a book by the Keno leader, that is Mr. P.S. Hawkeep. 
at the time of signing the Sioux Agreement. And this idea, it perfectly aligns with the idea of forming a Christian state with parts of India, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. I'll show you the uh, you know, book images here. This is the uh, you know, cover of the book, Jalengam, the Cookie Nation. It's by P.S. Haukif. And now this preface of the book, I'll not show any other pages. This is the preface of the book. And here it's mentioned as if, you know, like there was a country called Jalengam existing before, but during 1917, 1919, First World War, and, uh, you know, during the Indian National Army, INA, during World War II, Cookies have sacrificed their lives, but still this Jalengam was dismembered into three parts, one part into India, one part into Burma, and one part into East Bangladesh, uh, East Pakistan, that is the present Bangladesh. So like he's trying to bring a, a history, create a history. There was a nation Jalengam. This was broken into three parts. And here he is saying, Jalengam of my ancestor is not beyond dreams to realize it is within our grips. The day is not far off when the victims, sorry, the visions of Jalengam, the uh, flag of Jalengam is hoisted permanently in our land. On that day, all our losses will be restored and suffering of the past will be rewarded. Jalengam will flourish once again and take its rightful place in the community of nations. So Jalengam, what they are demanding, what they are thinking of, is not an union territory, it's not a separate administration. It is a sovereign country they are demanding. Now, coming to the second issue, which is very important again, it's the illegal immigration. Now, uh, mostly illegal immigration of cookies is the main uh, concern right now, and I'll show you why. So uh, from all British records, we could find mention that in the year 1881, there were about 6,000 cookies settled in Manipur, and there were about 77 villages. We call them uh, these uh, old cookies. They were very much a part of Manipur. They have become, uh, you know, like part and parcel, important part and parcel of Manipur. They love Manipur. I have friends with them, uh, you know, like these uh, old cookies as we call. They are, they want, we want to keep them separate. I don't think they are involved in any, um, you know, movement about breaking up Manipur or against the idea of Manipur. Now, 1949, when Manipur was merged into India, there were total 250 villages of Kuki communities. And in 2023, there are more than 3,000 Kuki villages. So how this growth, exponential growth came about is because, you know, there are three... Uh, Three men, uh, you know, mass migration happened. One is in the year, one was in the year 1967, the Khadan operation by the then uh, Myanmar government that was uh, aimed against, specifically against Jin Kuki people. So we saw mass migration happening, uh, you know, coming inside Manipur. And then between 1972 and 75, when the army coup in Myanmar happened and political crisis was happening there in Myanmar, again, mass migration happened. And here, uh, I'm not saying this, uh, you know, out of, uh, you know, uh, like inducing out of uh, all this, uh, because what happened, it must have happened like that. There are government records in which uh, Burmese Refugee Association was formed and they wrote to the government of Manipur asking for aids and for settlement of these uh, refugees in Manipur. So uh, this happened and then recently into 2021, we saw the Myanmar government took over by the army. And again, between 2021 and 23, the estimate given is that 22,000 cookies, uh, including our militants, they've entered Manipur. Now, this is a very, very conservative uh, estimate, I believe, because, you know, like uh, in one of the TV interviews, ex um, army uh, Assam Rifles, Major Bansal, he admitted in the TV interview that he kind of mentioned that more than a lack of illegal immigrants in Georgianpur are there and they're suffering along with the you know citizens because their lack of supply in that context he mentioned so Assam rifles surely have reports and it is not uh, in thousands 
entrants have crossed lakhs. And, uh, you know, just in one day, there's a record of 718 people coming in, in just one day. I'll show you in next slide. This is the record. This is given by the Assam Rifles, Lieutenant Colonel, to the Deputy Commissioner Chandel District. Here you can see details of people coming in, illegal immigrants, and 718 people have come in. Now, next slide. I'll show you the growth of villages in Manipur. So uh, ignoring everything, if you concentrate on the right side, increase. Where, wherever there are increases of villages, 296, it is in Chandal, 258 is in Tenopal, 542 is in Kampokpi, 560 villages increased in Georgianpur. All these four areas are cookie dominated areas. So the increase in villages, the issue of illegal immigrants coming, these are all related and this is happening in the among the Kuki communities because they believe those people who are staying in Myanmar, they are their kith and clean kins, they are belonging to the same community. So they welcome them. Openly, this is admitted by all of them, their leaders, they don't believe in boundaries. So this is how it is happening, the exponential increase in number of villages. Now coming to the third issue, the poppy plantation and deforestation. Here, uh, in 2018, the government of Manipur started war on drugs and eviction drive of illegal encroachers from forest land and government buildings. Actually, this is what triggered uh, you know, all this violence, uh, all the uh, starting of taking action against poppy plantations and all this. Now, uh, it is proven that all these illegal immigrants, they come in and they have uh, no work, no means of survival. So these drug lords, they use them as cheap labor for poppy plantation. So wherever these new villages are, uh, you know, uh, coming up, we can see poppy plantation happening in the surrounding areas. And because of this uh, poppy plantation, obviously forests have to be emptied and climate change is happening in a very big way in Manipur. You know, this year record hot climate is like reaching up to 42 degrees Celsius have been recorded. I think in September, we all remember the way that pleasant and so, you know, like good. In. It's a hill state, you know, so temperature never reaches 40. But now we see that temperature is raising 42. It's because only because of this deforestation and massive deforestation happening. And this year we also saw flood happening, uh, you know, the very damaging flood happening in Impa. Now, this year in the... Uh, Government of Manipur report, first May 2024 report, uh, there is admittedly 996 illegal immigrant villages. So 996 villages, how many homes they will have, how many families, and the families will have how many uh, members. So you can imagine like it will be, uh, you know, not less than 50,000 people there. And these villages are established after cutting down trees and leveling the forest. Leading, this is one very big factor leading to deforestation. And the last point I've mentioned here is the National Green Type Tribunal. It has taken note of the data given by the government of Manipur that Manipur had the forest cover of 17,475 square meter in 1984. And in 2021, this was decreased to 16,598, that is, a total loss of 877 square kilometer of forest cover. Imagine, 877 square kilometer of forest cover lost. And this is primarily to grow poppy. So this is a very, very serious concern. It, it concerns the future of the state and it impacts overall that area, Northeast region and India. Now, this is uh, data given by the Narcotics and Affairs of Border, NAB, Manipur. Here, they have given, you know, community-wise, Kukichin, Nagas, and others, and the Popi cultivation, where it is happening. So in Kukichin area, down 2017 to 18 to 2020 to 23, total area of 13,121 acres are used for Popi cultivation. Nagas, 2,340 others 35. Here we see 2022-23 a reduction in uh, acres cultivation of poppy, you know, 804 from 2,600 
because of the, uh, you know, against drug drive by the government of Manipur. Lots and lots of poppy plantations were destroyed during this time, which we believe, you know, took a great part in angering the community. Now, next slide is of the NDTP report, May 16, 2023. Here, the first column is similar, uh, like as NAB data. I'm giving it separately because of the next column. That is the number of arrests in last five years under the NDPS Act. Total number of 2,518 people were arrested, out of which Muslims, 1,083, Ukichin, 873, and Meritais, 381. So it's not only the Kukichin community involved in drugs. Yes, in poppy plantation, they are heavily into it because uh, they are basically the area where they are staying and the illegal immigrants factor. All of this, you know, were uh, coming together combined to make it, uh, you know, uh, beneficial for them to do this poppy plantation. It's for the drug lords also, it's easy money for them to employ cheap labor. All these factors combined, uh, you know, make them the area, the area where they stay to be where the poppy plantation is happening. And then for smuggling, all other communities are also involved, as we can see from the data. So uh, here I just want to highlight a point that when the state government and the central government starts a war against drug, it should not be just, you know, uh, sowing destruction of the poppy plantation. It should be all the hierarchy. You know, there should be fight all the hierarchy that is smugglers, the drug lords, and of course the poppy plantation. And while dealing with the poppy plantation, you have to deal it in a more humane manner because these are the lower strata. They do it for the day labor. So uh, you identify who are the illegal immigrants, who are the citizens, treat them separately, give them all the human rights, and then you know alternative means of survival you can this is a long-term plan. You can handle it sensitively and then, you know, reduce by steps. Here, what the, uh, it's my personal assessment. What the state government did was destroy the poppy plantation. And then, you know, uh, it is done. Work is done. Kind. It, lots of them were destroyed. But then it's not handling the crux of the matter in an effective manner. It's just like uh, showing to the people that you are, fighting, uh, you know, like against drug menace and all that. But effectively, it is just angering the common people. And then it is a giving, you know, fruitful ground for the drug lords and the separatists to uh, use these people, these angry people, employ them as militants, using them against the state. So this is uh, my personal assessment that this could have been handled in a more sensitive manner to be more effective. Now, coming to next slide, there uh, is actually international hands in the crisis. As I mentioned before, there's dream about Jalengam. It is, uh, as uh, you know, the outgoing uh, former Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina, also said that the United States is backing establishment of a Christian state, uh, taking parts of India and Myanmar and Bangladesh. You know. So this is kind of the idea is coming together with the idea of Jalengam, which Mr. P.S. Hawkett mentioned in his book. And then again, we have the recent use of drone bombs, missiles, the attack at Kotruk and Moirang. In fact, the missile attack was targeting the first chief minister's house, Mr. Koring's house. And one person was killed. And then a uh, recent intel report, we have this report of 900 cookie militants, trained militants, entering Manipur in batches of 30. This was confirmed by the security advisor, Mr. Kuldeep Singh. So definitely uh, the hands of international you know, players, either uh, for drugs or support of a Christian state establishment, it's definitely there. Otherwise, uh, financing this crisis you know, with arms and ammunition for this more than one and a half year, it's impossible. So. This is a big national security issue. It's not just ethnic class between Metis and the cookies now. It's not anymore. Maybe it was in the beginning, but it's not anymore. Now, coming to the international angle, National Investigative Agency has also arrested a person 
this is the letter issued. He was involved in, you know, anti-India uh, conspiracy and all that you have mentioned here. So this is also proof enough and that the agency, investigation agency is also in cognizance of this. So this is national security issue. State government, the central government must unite to eradicate this uh, cookie militants posing a national security issue to the country and to Manipur in particular. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Gita ma'am, for your elaborate and uh, with the very fact uh, presentation. And uh, uh, there, I could see that you have uh, elaborated uh, in your presentation, mostly the post-violence, uh, the 3rd of May, 2023. Uh, however, I would like to, I'm not going to use any PPT, however, I'll give some points by point, and that also bases on the facts. And I'm going to elaborate a little bit uh, how this May 3rd, 2023, this this was a, just a kind of uh, that this uh, Hukki, uh, this community, they thought that this is the right time to start because they have fully prepared. And what happened exactly before that? So let me uh, come back with this, uh, uh, the day. <clears throat> there was a, a bill proposed in Manipur uh, State Assembly, Legislative Assembly, that was on 28th of August, 2015. I mentioned again, 28th, 28th August, 2015, the Protection of Manipur People's Bill, 2015. This was proposed, and in that particularly, the idea of the government was to the protect the, the indigenous people. And uh, what they proposed is that uh, the NRC, the year for the cutoff year to be used for the National uh, Register of Citizens should be used as a 1951. And uh, the people who are in Manipur as per the census report 1951, they should be considered uh, as per this uh, People's Bill and also the village directory of 1951. So this was uh, the People's uh, the protection the fair protection of Manipur People Bill 2015, and I mentioned again that was 28 August 2015, and just after three days that was 31st August 2015, there was a protest the violent protest erupted in church and just after three days and in that the the kuki people mostly the church is uh inhabited by the Paiti community again sub community of kuki people so nine people they have uh, been killed in the police firing because these protesters attacked the church police station Police retreated, uh, retaliated, and in that uh, firing, nine people died. After that, this dead bodies of nine people, they were not ready to cremate. The discussions, the negotiations happened with the, the, the government of Manipur. And finally, government of Manipur had to change, had to change this cutoff year of 1951 to 1961. Yes, you see this. You see this, the kind of power. Okay. And then uh, the 2018, already Gita Mem also mentioned that the war on drugs, the eviction drive, this already started by the government of Manipur uh, in 2018. However, there was a, the last state uh, legislative assembly election was held in uh, February, March 2022. In that, in BJP's manifesto was also there that they will continue on this war on drugs. They will continue to protect the indigenous people. Okay. Then, 13 March 2023 is last year. Last year, March month, and date was 13 March. Uh, Mr. Biren, Honorable Chief Minister of Manipur, Mr. Biren, met 
Amit Saji in New Delhi. Highlighting about this, uh, the security issue of Manipur, mainly he highlighted about this Su pact, the suspension of operation pact, the tripartite pact, and that too, that too, on 10th of March, some three or four days back, in the cabinet, in the state cabinet, they have decided that the since Su is a tripartite agreement, as you understood, the Manipur government that they, they took this in this cabinet decision that they are going to withdraw, particularly with the UP National Army, in short KNA and Jomi, Jomi Revolution Army JRA, because their leaders are from outside of Manipur. So that already you could see the fact from Gita Ma'am's presentation also. So this has definitely hurt this Uti community. Again, another important date, 27th March 2023. So there again, what happened? The Manipur High Court has gave a judgment for the recommendation of civil trap status to me. There was some technical issue on that, and that became a big uh, controversy over that. Even the Honorable uh, Chief Justice of India also said that the High Court does not have, or in fact, the court does not have any say to the recommendation of civil trap status to any community. So there was some technical mis error or something was there. However, however, this 27 March, this 20, this order, a uh, small correction to Gita Ma'am's presentation. This was this petition was filed by the Miti Tribe Union, not the STDCM. It was Miti Tribe Union. Now they call MMTU Miti Miti Tribe Union. Okay, and uh, of course our organization World Miti Council uh, was also one of the uh, uh, civil society organization which we are uh, have taken the movement of giving this recognition of civil tribe status to Miti. So mainly there are three organizations. Uh, the first, the oldest one is the STDCM, then the World Mythic Council, and also the MTU. Now MMTU also joined in this uh, demand. However, this high court, this petition was uh, initiated by the MTU that time, and the high court, Manipur High Court, gave this uh, order. So they took this opportunity. However, you see the the things have been already there. Series of series of things were there to take action against this community plus also this community have they have a lots of anguish or they are already kind of they want to take a revenge that sort of uh, the attitude have been developed and they i think decided that yes the time has come for them to start a war against the miti against the government and that was the 3rd of may when they the the so-called the rally that was named as a solidarity rally for the tribal community against the order of this civil tribe. This was mainly the, the rally was initiated mainly by the Atsum, All Tribal Students Union of Manipur. This Atsum is a body for them. They claim that they are all included, all the tribal community, may then the Kuki and the Naga community. However, in that really, it was uh, performed the, in the Chochanpur and the Kangkokpi. But the Naga students, part of this Atsum, they did not take really seriously to uh, conduct this rally. Okay. Now, that solidarity really is supposed to be a peace rally. Okay. And we could see from the footages, the video footages, that there were people. There are people who were using the sophisticated weapons like AK-47 and 56, and they participated in the rally. Okay, so that was the questions, and also as mentioned in the Gita Ma'am's presentation, why, how come the national media and international media was there? Is it something they have? Everything they have the uh, done a, a proper planning. Okay. And I would like to refer, and the rest is the, 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 the story continues. And today you see that how 
this community framed, how this community framed that the Miti is on the wrong side and they are actually the legitimate, they're claiming that this is their, uh, the motherland or something, blah, blah. And just to mention that in Banipur, if there are only, if we say that, if we ask someone that who are the indigenous community, it is one is the Miti and other is the Naga. Kuki definitely came from outside, mostly from the Myanmar, and all this ruckus is going on now. And I would like to mention one more point on the recent statement by Lieutenant General Rana Pratap Kalita on Karan Thapur's interview that he, he blamed the Manipur police and he uh, gave a clean chit to the Assam Rifles. I want a very basic question to Rana Pratap Kalita Ji. If you say that, then on May 3rd, 2023, on that peace rally, how come they were already on the soup pack? How come those militants carrying those sophisticated army uh, weapons, who allowed that? Is not the Assam Rifle? Then how come they, he can give a clean cheat to Assam Rifles? This is my question. Okay, that's all Ravi Shankar Ji and uh, Vidya Ji from my side. And uh, if you if you have any questions from the audience, please throw the questions to us. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, Gita ma'am, I'll start the questions with you. So you had mentioned that uh, uh, the, about the SOI agreement, you know, the, the terms and uh, conditions. What, uh, why do you think that the government of India has failed to act against it or repeal the SOI? Thank you, Vidya ji. Actually, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, it's open knowledge that these militants have violated the terms and conditions. But year on year, this uh, agreement has been extended. And why it has been extended and why they are trying to extend now, still after all this crisis happening. In my assessment, the very uh, you know object of having these militants sign this agreement, uh, as you know, majority of the Maitis perceived, is to control the NSC and the Naga insurgencies and the very best Meite insurgencies using this cookie militant. This is one of the factor. And this purpose has not been completed yet. And it's not you know, just the BJP government. It is continuously government of India's policy. This has been continuing. And in fact, in the 1990s, almost all the very best insurgency groups have been wiped out using these cookie uh, militant groups. So this is one factor which, you know, like dealing with them with so many years, maybe uh, there are things which cannot be, you know, abruptly stopped. This has to be a factor uh, to be considered also. They cannot abruptly stop and appropriate the agreement. There has to be a process of step. Either, you know, you put them uh, strictly as per the agreement inside the camps, try to rehabilitate them. If the intention is, you know, truly to bring them into society, and you know, uh, to stop any kind of operations, then stop making the militants, you know, take away their arms and try to integrate them into the society. But the intention is not that, obviously. It's been continuing for so many years, new recruitments allowed. So the perception of the Maiti people that this was agreed between the Assam Rifles security forces and the Kuki militants, and the purpose was to stop the militant, other community militant groups insurgency groups who are demanding sovereignty. This is still not successful. Maybe that's why. And as I said, the relation has been for years and they cannot abruptly stop. And another factor is uh, geopolitical issues. You know, India's policy towards the East, especially Myanmar and China. So when Chinese invasion, if it happens, uh, Indian government close relation with these cookie militants and the Chin cookie groups in the other side, they are like one group. So this is one of the factor, many projects of India in Myanmar, you know, the protection of these projects. Indian government is depending on these groups also. So this kind of collaboration outside is impacting the, you know, like relation inside India also. And the Maitis, the plight of Maitis is like falling victims because of these policies. This is what I believe. We were talking about arms. 
we were saying you know, they are getting arms and uh, they were using sophisticated arms for that matter where is this arms coming from because i don't think you know it is coming from the indian region where you know through the thing it should be coming from the from the borders where are they getting from and more importantly is myanmar supporting this cause and helping them with the arms and everything even if it is actually an external force like us let's say united states of america still they should have the support of the the government over there to provide arms and getting them over there and all i would like to actually know a bit more into that uh, uh, aspect anyone of you can take the question um, not an issue okay i can uh, take this question uh, ravi shankar ji uh, the recent report where this is uh, the operation has been uh, conducted and uh, uh, some uh, more than 1000 weapons have been uh, captured and as per the government data i think uh, uh, it is uh, beyond 1200 as per the government record 1200 is the kind of the, the arms which have been uh, uh, taken away from the uh, the government's uh, uh, the maybe the police forces but the recover the arms is much more than Uh, this number so definitely this arms must be coming from definitely from outside now we cannot say this at this moment whether this is sponsored by uh, the myanmar government or any i we, we cannot say that but definitely there is a huge base huge base of this chin kuti community in myanmar and they are very strong and they are very strong and also they have enough money they have enough money and you could you could just connect the recent attack uh, the kind of the sophistication the uh, level of sophistication they using a uh, drone bombs okay and in fact in fact there was a uh, revelation by this uh, uh, the the chief of the security forces that the kind of weapon the level of sophisticated weapon they are using the 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 manipur the police or the manipur commander they cannot handle so definitely there should be more sophisticated people to be given to this the manipur commando or the manipur police commando whatever or any other security uh, forces uh, so this is definitely a big alarming and there is there is a, a a strong hand from outside of india and this is definitely a national security issue i have a follow up just for that um i will ask this because actually unless if i ask later actually it won't the connection will not be there we we talked about the arms if i these kuki militants are coming from myanmar that we have established uh, my question is see we have the similar problem in in our uh, western border and the people from the militants from in jammu and kashmir i'm saying militants from actually pakistan is coming into the country and these militants have been trained by various organizations with the help of the pakistani government over there isi and such like uh, jaish e mohammed or uh, mujahideen or whichever organization there may be they have been trained and sent here for a purpose and they have the backing of the uh, the pakistani government over there either their intelligence agency or whichever means it may be similarly is there an organization in myanmar who are training them and bringing them to, or sending them to this country and you know arms training uh, what need to be done here that kind of a thing i am not sure actually if there is any muslim organization like jaish e mohammed or anything over there so is there any particular organization or a group or uh, probably the um, the intelligence agency or something which is giving them this training and all uh ravi shankar ji in my view the context will be much different with the the jammu and kashmir issue because here the the kuki themselves they are quite uh, self sustained they quite self sustained because uh, they have their own base in uh, uh in Myanmar which is the the chin state and the sagang state so they are predominantly this ethnic uh, these people are there and uh, in fact in fact in the Myanmar government they are so powerful uh, in the last uh the government of myanmar when the democracy was there uh, there are two mps from from this uh, places uh, uh, sorry the kuchin kuki uh, mps member of parliament representing in that so they have a very strong hold and uh, i don't think is that any other uh, 
the openly any international organization uh the funding them because they are self sufficient they're self sufficient you could see that the kind of the money they have earned from this uh, poppy cultivation and uh, in fact in fact there was a news in the very preliminary stage uh, during this uh, may and then the army was doing the operation and this uh, mla uh, which magita ma'am also mentioned that kim new hockey uh, she was the one who in fact uh, uh, took a selfie in the poppy gardens and posted in the very social media that uh, glorifying herself that you know they are doing this kind of thing and uh, in her constituency this cycle that itself however this did not came up in the in the news media uh, but there was a report that the army when they uh, did the operation they found that there was a factory producing this kind of uh, the heroines and all these things okay and uh, this this it was in her own uh, constituency so they are self sufficient in terms of the fund in terms of their the training base because uh, they are also uh, they have also camp in the in the bangladesh and also they have a camp largely in myanmar i think they are self sufficient in terms of the money in terms of the the technology of course if they have the money they can procure the arms from any 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 anywhere i think this address your your question Uh, does uh, I mean like you know the kind of operations that they are doing and with the uh, with the sophistication that they are doing in terms of arms whatever at least on one side but the planning where to go how to do how to project in the media and all those things don't you think actually you know, it requires an elaborate resources to do like that to have that planning and everything between and we were mentioning about the the international influence in it also uh, before so there might be somebody. Uh, logically there might be somebody actually who might be helping them how to create the narratives and how to project it in the media how to uh, give that narrations when it comes to actually you know uh, to the government when they are negotiating so is there actually any known entities actually you know from apart from this cookies somebody who is uh, outside actually providing such resources yeah so there are there are lots of uh, hypotheses uh, are there but uh, at this platform i don't want to comment however there are lo- uh, there are lots of hypotheses uh, but one thing is that this particular community they are very very shrewd they are very very shrewd they are they are uh, sort of like uh, actually their nature is kind of a nobody and if you see wherever there is the opportunity they can turn into it. they themselves claim that they are the lost tribe of jerusalem uh, 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 israel they claim that they are the the benai messiah one of the lost tribe and uh, uh when this uh, wl hang singh uh, is i think uh, the the ex is officer he negotiated he did this uh, uh with the with the israel government and uh, they uh, signed i think he probably said that under his initiative it's available in the article various articles that uh, 2000 uh, kuki people from uh, manipur and 1000 uh, kuki people from mizoram they sent this total 3000 people they sent to uh, israel so they they are very opportunists in nature i think they have this instinct i think they may be very intelligent and i think because of that even this uh, i think the the government the india government is uh, unable to do much against them till now and this is very unfortunate okay and definitely there could be linkage but at this platform i cannot say that because i don't have any any uh, facts uh, all in on on this here yeah i understand mostly because uh, the the international terrorist organizations are constantly monitored and informations are provided whereas on this side of the world it's not so much exposed as it is on the other i definitely get that uh, ronin who came to the speaker fair platform were you able to uh, unmute yourself ronin like i said actually on the right, yeah talk yes yes Go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, no, Please actually, ask your question. I, 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 okay, I already asked my questions. However, yeah, I just uh, to add. Uh, I have a uh, one more question just to add uh, over and about my my this uh, my two questions I asked already. And thank you for much. Uh, thank you so much for responding to that. Uh, 
Now the question is the government of India is one of the most powerful, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, having said that, uh, the the you know, the current situation and the extent of the uh, jo Uki community uh, and their insurgent group, uh, they are also powerful. But it is nothing but in front of the Indian government. And the Indian government wants, I think, uh, they have the capability to counter, you know, those. So, is my second question would be: Is there any check and balances remain, or is there something that in really, uh, 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 you know, uh, led us to worrying uh, fact living in uh, you know, Manipur, because they since the you know issue the, the clashes started, there is no actual action that needs to be taken care of. Things are being done, but it is very slow. They are just uh, what you know, spectator, and just they want to you know solve it, you know, necessarily not by you know interfering in those issues. So my question is: Is there any check and balance remains with those uh, those who are under true agreement? Because the people are terribly suffering in the you know, in the valley and. Some parties also, you know, uh, having that issue from the, uh, you know, the rest of, from last couple of months and uh, yes, several times. They, Ronin, actually, they I believe your question, the, the two part question is the first is the Indian government is very powerful; they can actually take care of all these militants. Why it is not happening? The second is what are the checks and balances, or what need to be done in terms of actually, you know, the agreements and everything, or going forward, where can be escalations and all. I believe it. That is the question, isn't it? I guess, I guess so. Go ahead. Gita, ma'am, would you like to take this uh, question? Okay, yeah. sure. I'll uh, take the supplement. Uh, in yes, yes. Many points. Yeah. So, uh, as regards to why the powerful Indian state is not able to control the violence which, uh, you know, to everybody's imagination, you know, if it really wants to control, it could very easily take harsh measures and take control within days, if not weeks. So like, uh, why it is not able to, it's because the intention itself, you know, the forces, the state forces, the central forces, the paramilitary, for, uh, paramilitary forces, they are not going in the same direction. This could be seen in the actions, like, you know, there is a central command in place, but there is not a central command. Different uh, types of orders are being given by the state government. These are thwarted by the central forces. You know, we can see in the beginning of the crisis, classes between the state forces and the Assam rifles. So there is no movement in one direction towards controlling the crisis. There is no intention to control the crisis, in my belief, from the central government. So why this happened? is probably because of the factors of the Sioux militants, as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the relation between Assam Rifles and Sioux militants, how it began from 2005, and uh, you know, going against them suddenly, using fire against them because uh, they are attacking. And you know, like uh, in the beginning, we can see central forces uh, standing as mute spectators when houses were burned. You know, people are running together, like uh, out of the villages. I, I have to admit, they were helping people from shifting from one place to another. They were taking uh, actions for safety of the people, but there was no action taken to stop the violence. There was no harsh action taken against the perpetrators, both sides. So there is a lack of intention to stop the violence. Maybe uh, the perception was it's an ethnic, ethnic violence. They will fight it out and you know it'll end in some days. So intention may, was maybe like to stop them from meeting each other. That's why the buffer zone came about. But the fact that this violence was allowed to persist for more than one and a half years. So it's like uh, the intention of the central government is not very clear. It's definitely not to stop the violence. There is a hidden agenda, I believe, that, you know, separating the population from each other creating a buffer zone, which is becoming kind of legitimized. I don't know who has buffer zone inside their own territory. 
like you can hear international borders and all. But here we have a buffer zone and you, you can see notice, you know, you are entering cookie areas, beware, that kind of thing happening. And you know, the, our own chief minister, they, he cannot go outside Imphal areas. So these kind of thing that the uh, outside the buffer zone, the central government is taking care of, inside you take care of, this is admitted position even by the chief minister. So there's no transparency in the central policy. There is apparently no intention to stop the violence using harsh measures. Otherwise, uh, at the time of using drones, drone bombs and missiles, the central forces could have easily tackled it using harsh measure, firing even air power they could have used it. It was not used. In fact, uh, many leaders started coming out in TV saying that there was no drones used, no missile used. It was only locally made pumpy. Even if it is locally met, it is illegal. You are fighting against the public, you know, against citizens. So this kind of thing, you know, there is, it seems there is no intention to stop the violence in the first place. That's why all this issue. Otherwise, the powerful Indian state, it has every means to stop it. So there is lack of coordination between the state forces and the central forces and no intention to stop the violence. If Navakishwasi wanted to add something to this, this is my perception, my personal view. Absolutely, absolutely right, Gita, ma'am. That's what uh, we have been telling from, you know, uh, in the, of course, when the violence started, we are also quite clueless because uh, Miti was never, never uh, uh, kind of, we could not even uh, believe ourselves that this can happen to Miti, right? The Miti could not believe at all. And then we assume that, we assume that the, definitely the government will do something until today. Till today, we are still expecting that the central government will do some harsh measure. And why not? The the one of the third largest uh, military, uh, the powerful, uh, like uh, the government of India, cannot handle this uh, this uh, small issue. It's I think it's all problem because of the kind of the attitude and the kind of the intention. Uh, but I think there are also some international power, uh, international. Uh, influence to this to this government because of the their some past records and but the slowly slowly again the the definitely the truth will prevail so definitely now it has come with a very very fact to the public that and we could see now the national media even international media they come to know that what is what is the true behind of this violence okay so I think, though it took time, though the Métis suffered a lot, but I think uh, 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 very soon, very soon, uh, the central government, I think they have also already realized, recently Amit Shah have already admitted with the statement that there is a illegal influx from uh, Myanmar. And all this, this issue was because of that thing. So, I think this very soon we are again hoping, as usual. So, but uh, we are hoping this time with the family that the medias are, have already covered uh, the, the, the inside stories. So, uh, finger crossed, hoping the same thing again. That's all from my side. Absolutely. Vidyaji, your questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, my question uh, is to uh, uh, Kishorji, in one of your earlier talks, uh, the Sangam talks, I think if I'm not mistaken, you had mentioned about the Britishers bringing in the Chin cookie community during the uh, early uh, 19th century. What was their purpose in bringing in the Chin cookie community right to the place where there were Maitis and the Nagas? Yeah, Vidyaji, of course, the the British made lots of mistakes, and uh, at that time, uh, during that World War, uh, the the Manipur being one of the remotest, so the Naga also had that uh, the rebel. They were they were uh, attacking the with the British British forces. So, in that, the British maybe maybe felt or they definitely felt that this uh, the cookie uh, these people they will settle in this uh, uh, adjoining of the valley and the hills area and that will help or make them easy to tackle this uh, the naga 
uh, who attacks this uh, British uh, uh, forces. So I think that was the main purpose. But today we are suffering because of that. And uh, of course, there were series of mistakes from the government of India. They should have been uh, taken care of it. And ultimately, today, the one and only the home for Mete is Manipur, and we are suffering. And uh, today, the situation is like this. What will happen to this community tomorrow? All of a sudden, the big missiles they throw to us, whether the security forces of uh, the government of uh, the central government, whether they have done this enough kind of thing, we, we still don't know. So this is the kind of situation for the Mete in Manipur as well. Uh, so, so would you say that that one act by the British at that point of time, <clears throat> that could be one of the main reasons why you are suffering as a community now, that introduction of the Chin uh, cookie community? Vidyaji, uh, of course, there was a, the, the planted, of course, that already the poison or the venom has been already planted. But after that, it is the government of India, Union government, who should take care of it, right? They should they should have done this uh, uh, the the measures not to happen what we are suffering today. I think that's all from my side. Right. Thank you, Nafik. Over to you, Ravi. Yeah, um, the. We, we are seeing that you know, there are uh, many parallels between what is happening in Bangladesh at the moment, because they are also, if you look at you know, our election, the parliamentary election that just finished, there was actually a big campaign going on saying that the elections are not uh, done legally. If there is actually tampering of EUMs, which have been going on very long time, which came back to this election also for the second time. And you know, there are certain parallels where you know, this, uh, the constitution is going to be changed and those kind of relatives were trying to build. And it was trying to actually kind of a, that, that is what exactly happened in Bangladesh, where it worked properly, where in India it didn't work for, thank God. And in Bangladesh also, the, the student unions were effectively used over there uh, to raise the protests and eventually toppling the government. Here also, I'm seeing that the student union is, is being used uh, for the rallies and all the uh, the protests and everything, which turned violent uh, on the way. Why student unions? It's not the parties or it's not the other organizations that are being used, but student union is being used. My question is why uh, students unions, which are actually now starting with this violence and... Uh, uh, Ravi Sankarji, I think your last part of your uh, two or uh, few lines were actually uh, not audible to us. Uh, okay, uh, I was asking in Bangladesh, students' unions were used effectively uh, to create protests and uh, and eventually toppling the government. And I see from your representation before, I see that here also the student unions were used in in protests and were the rallies and which turned violent. Uh, my question is, why student unions in both the places? Um, you don't need to talk about Bangladesh, but I'm seeing the parallel that here also student unions were used and the violence erupted from there and not the political parties or organizations who are involved. It was student unions. That's what actually now makes me wonder. I think uh, this is not particular to Bangladesh and not particular to this uh, Manipur violence where this uh, all of some travel uh, students union of Manipur. Uh, if you see that even in the China, uh, some decades back when this uh, uh, the the communist the government was challenged, that was also the students union who have been crushed to death. Almost ten thousand students have been died. So, I think yes, the students. Uh, group is one thing that they they are one sided that they are also uh, soft target. They are also the kind of uh, e can be easy target. And of course, there are some the intellectual some group of people who does not uh, come to the front, but they they utilize this uh, students group as their uh, kind of again I can say that army sort of army, right? 
they they motivate them they brainwash them uh, so i think this is a, the becoming a, a natural phenomena in today's today's world i think the same thing here also apply yeah and just to supplement that i think uh, the youths they are very emotional they are at that particular age you know where you can be easily you know uh, emotionally utilized and you are you have all the energies and uh, if you protest the state forces is a little reluctant to use harsh measures against the students so maybe all these factors also uh, plays a part in, in uh, students being used like uh, you know the lady fox they also are being used for this so in every protest where i'm saying across communities students like in, not only in india students are being used for this factor and they are they are very emotional and that particular age so they become the first target for political parties or forces to use as you know the protest main face of the protest absolutely absolutely they are easy to they are very emotional they are very easy they are very malleable to shape in the way that they would like whom our is controlling uh yes. vidhi yeah so uh, geeta ji this question is for you it's a two part question actually they're not connected you were mentioning about the buffer zone which have been introduced in the state <clears throat> so uh, what are the pros and cons of having the buffer zone and the other question is to do with the itlf the indigenous tribal leaders forum can you throw some light about that Uh, first question about buffer zones. Actually, uh, now it has become a necessity because of the hatred between the two communities. It's actually become necessary to divide the the, the two to prevent further violence. But in the beginning, you know, it should not have been allowed to happen. In fact, the 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 speed at which the uh, you know buffer zones has been created, I wish the same speed was used in creating you know the. international border lines you know the the fencing <laughs> there as you can see 30 km has been done so far and it has been stopped now by the kuki people and uh, actually the government of india relented and they started shifted in the naga naga areas so the power of this uh, you know like uh, kuki communities saying that the, we are of the same people like you know you cannot actually do fencing this is uh, creating a problem but for the buffer zones within a matter of days it was created if the crisis was controlled in the beginning because it's never a good idea to segregate people on the basis of ethnicity and to make it permanent it's not a healthy exercise they are demanding union territory statehood or sovereignty based on ethnicity so if we allow this to persist ultimately we have to cooperate live together harmoniously otherwise there is no option you cannot say i'll stay only with maitre i'll stay only with cookie it's not practical in this modern world so uh, if we allow this to happen and persist it will create a very bad example for india because india being a multicultural country people start thinking like you know oh is it possible to have your own state based on your ethnicity on your religion so this is a kind of uh, uh, really bad precedent i would say creating this uh, you know buffer zones i hope it won't be permanent there will be a solution soon and uh, it's not necessary it was not necessary at that point of time and right now yes it is necessary to protect each other and the security forces uh, i wish they could do it efficiently and not allow those kuki militants to you know infiltrate and then you know create issues in the border uh, in fringe area of the valley where there is months of uh, you know peaceful months and then suddenly some kuki militants sneak in and create a you know, violent because they want the violence to carry on you know they don't want peace to return so they keep continuing to do this so if the uh, buffer zones are there in place keep it efficient don't allow these militants to come in and you know create problems so for now uh, that is i think uh, necessary for keeping a peaceful atmosphere and coming back to your second question about itlf it is uh, indigenous tribals uh, the uh, forum of these kuki from my kuri kuki people it's actually not indigenous as navar kishor ji had mentioned kukis are not indigenous to in manipur they may be recognized as st what is indigenous origin of the place 
Admittedly, as per records, as per facts, they are not origin of this of this place. They have been allowed to stay and naturalize as citizen, but th that is different from the term indigenous. So uh, the term itself, the group name itself is wrong. That's what I wanted to say. And I think it is formed quite recently, you know, two, three years back before the crisis happened. And they have uh, ITLF, uh, you know, drone, drone group, I mean, like wing is there for drone. And we can see uh, receipts of that Israeli group, you know, Bane Manasi tribes, those people who stayed, uh, who has gone there, they helped them financially. And we can see the receipts signed by the drone uh, media sale or something. So they even have that kind of sophistication to have different IT sales, drone sales, this kind of, uh, you know, facilities there and financing is there from the foreign, uh, you know, countries. And I don't know if they have that, uh, you know, uh, license for receiving foreign funds because they recently formed. And so, in fact, you know, Vidyaji, if you follow the money trial, where this funding is coming from, one is obviously from the drug money, which is believed to be 60,000 crore to 75,000 crore, you know, two, three times the budget of annual budget of the state. So this is uh, very huge and serious money and money can you know, actually have all like serious power over many things. Uh, even like national media, we can see in the beginning, totally the narrative of the cookie have been you know, playing in the national media. It's only on the later days, like things started coming out. So uh, ITLF is nomenclature itself is wrong. And for two, there's another organization based in Kangkokpi, ITLF is based in Churchanpur. And they are basically the spokesperson or like, you know, the unit which is speaking on behalf of the cookie. There are many cookie common people who are not, you know, in favor of all this crisis, what's happening, what they are demanding. They're not bothered about having a separate state or country or anything. They want to live happily, peacefully. You know, in fact, uh, the CRPF chief came out in an interview after going to relief camp. He mentioned that the people, they are not bothered about any demands. They want to return to their homes and live peacefully. Next day, ITLF and the Students Union, they came out saying, what is he talking about? He should do security work and not talk about politics. So it is obvious that these groups, recently cropped up groups, surpassing all the previously existing associations, you know, they have combined and, you know, immersed as a, you know, head of these uh, cookie communities. Earlier, they were very uh, different, different association, old organizations. They're all silent now, not allowed to speak out at all. So ITLF is totally the spokes, like person acting as a spokesperson or organization of the cookie militants, the separatist groups. And the funding is obviously from the drugs, drug loads, which also is, uh, you know, joining this as a separatist group because there is obviously connection between the militants, the drug lords, and the politicians. As uh, Navakishoji was saying, one of the MLAs, she was posing away in the poppy plantation, poppy field, as if it's very legal. And one of the Uki leader, he was, uh, I think, ex-bureaucrat, he said some people are planting it because it's a beautiful flower. I mean, they are not even understanding the concept. It's an illegal business they are doing. So this kind of perception we need to change. And uh, of course, the farmer, they need to be handled a little more sensitively the poor people, so that they are not taken advantage of by the separatist group. But definitely ITLF, they need to be investigated, especially the fundings they are getting and uh, what kind of relations with other organizations, especially international ones, NAMTA and all the have US organization. Um, we need to check like what kind of organization. That, that is for the investigating agency to work out. And I think as I showed in the last slide, they have arrested people from outside India, uh, and uh, the same person was visiting a Khalistani movement, uh, you know, a meeting in the Gurudwara in Canada. So that kind of link is definitely there, but it is for the Indian investigative agency to find out what is the linkage of money, money trial, as we say, and everything will come out. Thank you, thank you. Can I can I add something here, Bidaji, if you allow me? Go ahead. Yeah, sure, sure. So, so the demanding a, a separate administration area or very specifically now they are saying that they want a union territory for their for their community. And if you look into this 
the past event, one of the major event was the 1992, year 1992 or 93, where in the same Churachanpur, they have uh, they have attacked the Naga uh, uh, inhabitants there. They wiped off them. And was not that the ethnic cleansing against the Naga at that time. So that was 1992-93 and it is now 2013 and 14. Okay? Almost 30 years. Is it not that the father the father have already wiped out this Daga community from the place and their son now indulges to wipe out the Miti community from this uh, Chochanpur area or the Kuki dominated area. The question, it is not like similar to how the Uttarakhand was formed, how the Chhattisgarh were formed, how the Telangana was formed. See the, see the intention behind it they have manipulated. They have manipulated and rightly Gitaji said that is it that something they are demanding union territory? For me, I would like to ask to the government of India that if you give the union territory status to them, the place for them as the union territory, for me, I think it's going to be uniting the terrorist group of the Kuti militants. The Union Territory is the name, but it will be uniting the terrorist group of Kuti militants. So I asked the government to rethink, reassess, and they, they have to do some quick action to sort out this issue. That's all I want to say. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Nabakishu. Very over yeah. to you. Yeah. Uh, we were mentioning about creating a Christian nation from parts of uh, Maripur, Bangladesh, and, uh, um, and, and Myanmar. So um, the, the question is actually now one is there similar activities going in Myanmar as well as in Bangladesh? And is there, a, what is the involvement of church in all this? Because it's a Christian nation that they are uh, purposely bringing, trying to bring it, bring out. Okay, uh, Ravi Sankar ji, at this moment, I do not want to comment, particularly in this situation where uh, related to this uh, Christian religion, because for the Mites in the same Chochanpur area, the Miti uh, Christians were also living there. The charges specifically for Miti community were also there. They have been burned down. They have been burned down. I think this is something uh, what they are looking is the beyond religion. And at this point of context, I don't want to mix up that because here the the whether a Miti who was practicing a Christian religion or Sanami or Hinduism, I think we 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 are suffering in the same level. And uh, I think bringing this will further complicate the the the, the context. Thank you. Um, the similar activities happening in Myanmar and uh, Bangladesh, as it is happening here, is there any similar um, uh, problems actually happening over there to bring all these things together and form a form a separate country? Uh, for their the, the Jalengam or this uh, Jomi land or the Kuki land, synonymously they, they are coming. So as far as there, even they have a map, and in that they are actually uh, uh, taking the part of uh, the Manipur. I mean, for, from the from India, and then the majorly the dominated in this area from uh, the Myanmar, basically this Chin Sagang state. And of course, from the ba Bangladesh, this, uh, the Arakan, uh, this is some of the, the areas where they also uh, settled at point of time. I think all this, wherever they are, uh, the footprint 
and in fact i think they are also uh, uh, adding the the majoram also in that in their plan of course these are all illegal things i think uh, it is not going to recognize by any even international body and uh, so it is just a kind of a dream and 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 definitely this is not going to work out so maybe the the authorities the government of india the international bodies they are i think uh, not taking the things very seriously in the beginning but i think the time has come because of the lots of evidence has now now appeared and now the time has come they will not definitely go with the kind of the uh, uh, the pre assume that it is something going uh, against the, the christian or something because the first the humanity should come the humanity is the ultimate religion so so i think people has to understand the leaders will understand and definitely uh, it will not go to the direction what they are expecting or they are looking for Go ahead, Vidhiji. Okay, uh, so this is a, a quite a general question and I would like to hear both your viewpoints uh, regarding the situation. Do you see a light at the end of the tunnel? Okay. Uh, go ahead and then I would like to hear both. I'll just first answer these. Yes, definitely, you know, we do see light at the end of the tunnel. Why I say this, in spite of all whatever is going on, no support from central government and the state government having no power and appearing clueless. I say this because during this crisis of one and a half year, I see many things being churned out. You know, like I never knew about all this myself personally, in spite of being an educated person and uh, origin from my own state. I'm not talking about people from all the other states. I myself didn't know about many things happening, especially the illegal immigrants, poppy plantation to this extent, illegal, you know, like uh, deforestation going on. So many things that were hidden because of this crisis have come up. And the Maitais in particular, like Navar Kishorji, I met him uh, during this crisis. We came to know each other. Likewise, the Maitais have connected. They have become slowly very difficult, but slowly they are becoming one voice. At least uh, they are united in preserving the territory of Manipur. There will be uh, like no question asked about this. Every Manipuri who are indigenous, they don't want to break up Manipur. So this united voice, which has resulted out of this crisis, it is giving me hope for the future. And uh, with this also, you know, preservation of our tradition and culture, once the youngsters especially like they were so so influenced by western culture and then k-pop and everything but now because of this crisis you know we are seeing a revival of the culture so this is also another positive outcome we cannot let our manipuri culture very rich in tradition and big, big long history we cannot let this die down so a kind of revival is coming up uh, because of this crisis the awareness of our community the richness of our culture and heritage this has come up and as long as the people are united, you know, the Maitai community, as long as we are united and true to our purpose, stick with the facts, the truths, there is no force in the world which can defeat it. Even though uh, the Union of India, the government, central government has uh, some you know, policy which is against us, it can still be persuaded because ultimately it is our government. We have elected the government. It has to protect the citizens. We have to show them you know, through our common voice, that it is their duty to protect us, the lives and property of the citizens against outside forces, control the separatist force. This has to be, you know, loudly put across the central government. And it is very much possible that, yes, uh, dividing Manipur is impossible, will not allow it under any circumstances, any development plan, you know, Manipur has to be, as before, all the communities staying together, development plan, the allocation of budget, this all can be discussed out and all the citizens staying in Manipur should have equal rights over the land, over everything. And ST rights, if Manipuri Maitais are demanding it, it's not for anyone to give it or not give it. It's for the law. There's a procedure. If we are eligible, we get it. And how to work out without you know, interfering with the rights of the other ST, that can always be worked out. These are very, very minor issues. 
like in other states, Nagaland and Mizoram and everywhere, ST rates how they are divided between the communities. Similar pattern we can follow here also. That's not a big deal. It is taken just as an excuse to, you know, like uh, you bring up this violence and then, then bring in their agenda of having a separate union territory. As I said, they say separate unitary, union territory or separate council and then uh, separate state. But when they demand before the, uh, you know, European Union, before United Nations, UN, and then before Israel, they write as a separate sovereign country. So their demand keeps changing. So this cannot be allowed. I think the central government is in seize of all these facts and material. I'm sure we'll see some positive actions. And we are seeing some, you know, actions being taken already. The two battalions of Assam rifle being moved out. Obviously, they must have investigated and done some demands of the Métis. They must have investigated and taken the, some proof must have been found. And CRPF brought in. And, uh, you know, like, uh, for for this hope to materialize, uh, taking out the arms from the citizens is a must. The Kuki militants must not be armed. Likewise, the village volunteers of both communities must not be armed. It's not for the students or the young to uh, youngsters to have arms. They are taking up arms because the securities have failed their jobs. They have failed to protecting to lives and property of the people. So they're forced to take up arms. So this kind of thing, uh, you know, like we hope to see uh, some positive actions from the central government and the state government like acting together. And yes, indeed, I'm a very positive person. I do have some hope, you know, of seeing some light in the very near future. Thank you, Geeta ji. Nabha Kishore ji, your viewpoints on the scene. Okay. Uh, Vidya ji, <clears throat> The, the second phase of war is going on now. The 3rd May last year, the, the, the level of violence, they have spread it from Chochanpur and then uh, Chochanpur and then they have done this in uh, More. And then in the month of June, they have again uh, initiated in Jiribam. Okay. And all of a sudden, this month, September, they have done this again, this attacks. And uh, there is a report that there are 900 uh, well-equipped militants have been entered to, to Manipur. So these are all a big concern. Of course, what Gita Mem or Gita Ji put this point that from the Métis side, yes, uh, as for the population globally, we are near 18 lakhs uh, people. Okay, even comparing to uh, the Chin Kuki community, they're almost in the scale of 45 to 50 lakhs, as per my research done. But for the Métis, it's just 18 lakhs. And uh, in the Manipur itself, we are almost 15 uh, and half, uh, 15 lakhs around. And then in Assam, we have around uh, two and a half lakhs kind of population. And then uh, spread it to uh, Tripura and also the Bangladesh. So putting together, we can figure out around it. And for the Miti, it is on one home, and that is uh, the Manipur. Of course, the, the Miti is living in Assam. We are also indigenous here. Miti living in uh, Bangladesh and also in uh, Tripura. They are also living in this. But in terms of the count, we are very, very, very negligible way compared to the, the other the, the community living in the uh, outside of Manipur, but Manipur predominantly we are. And in this around say 15 to 15 and a half lakhs of uh, the Métis population today, as per the, the data or the kind of the, the statistics analysis, 12 lakhs, 12 lakhs are the, the population of Chin Kuki in Manipur. It's very alarming. And they have already surpassed the, the population of Naga, were indigenous there, and uh, Naga could be around eight, eight and a half to uh, nine lakhs. Okay, so they have already surpassed. And if you see that whether there is a a light end of this tunnel, of course, for me, they, we are very hopeful people. We are very peace lover, and still we are expecting the same thing from the, the honorable prime minister. He could visit. Russia, 
to resolve this uh, Russia and uh, uh, this this conflict, the uh, Ukraine conflict. But why not? He take it seriously to resolve this uh, issue on Manipur. If Miti is wiped out from Manipur, then I think Miti is gone forever from this uh, from this planet. So of course we are hoping we are united, and Miti is of course the brave uh, uh, son. They have survived so many years of history. Uh, Gitaji said the two two thousand years, but it's actually beyond that. Even three thousand years old, we have uh, this with uh, the archaeological fact. It is there. Maybe more than that. Also, we have been surviving with even the tiny population. It's just because of the kind of the spirit, the the braveness what this Miti has, and we'll definitely survive. However, in the current situation, with the kind of this nine hundred militants coming into it, but one thing is that. Why there is a ray of hope? One thing is that in the previous context, the national media, international, international media, they have always been looking the Meite is the, we are the, 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 the culprit. Whereas we were the victim. This has been changed. This has been changed. And in fact, in fact, Amit Saji, now he is clearly speaking out. I think that 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 is the hope uh, we are having now. But the war is still there. War is the intense war. The intense war in the ground. It is it is the same kind of repetition. It's happening, and this time the government should come out with the open, honestly, to save meeting. Okay, we don't want to happen that that. The, their father killed the Naga and their son killed the Mite and it should not continue again their green, grandchild should kill the others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nimba Kishore. over to you. Right. So this is a question that I should have asked earlier or the first question should have been this uh, because in Manipur actually there has been violence before also. Uh, there was a history of violence in, um, in in Manipur. I believe actually there was actually 344, I mean, not like um, uh, the emergency kind of situation was being established for six months over there before, if I'm not mistaken. What's the difference between the violence back then and what it is happening now? How it is different now? I think, Gita, ma'am, if you can take this question. Sure. So uh, earlier violence, uh, whatever happened earlier and which brought in the emergency measures, uh, they were not about breaking up Manipur. And they were not about ethnic cleansing of Maitis from certain territories or about buffer zones being created and becoming a reality. This crisis is different because it is uh, actually challenging the very existence of Manipur and Maitis in particular. That's why it's different and uh, allowing it uh, for this many months, more than a year to persist, it is making it more serious and things are making it, uh, you know, becoming more defined and the hatred is becoming more imprinted on the hearts, of hearts and mind of the people to the point of, you know, youngsters getting affected, students getting affected. So this crisis in that sense is very different. Earlier crisis, of course, Manipur has been strife ridden from day one. Uh, demanding of statehood and then after long years of struggle after getting it then ILP in inner line permit demands has been you can see that and then uh, you know, June 18 uprisings and then uh, again the Naga demand uh, you know NSC and I am uh, accord with the government of India that sparked another you know uh, spark or various form of violence again but this time it definitely is different because it strikes the very fundamentals of uh, Manipur and being mating. So this is uh, something uh, I perceive from this balance. Absolutely. I asked that question specifically for those who doesn't know, should understand why it is so important to uh, resolve this issue at the earliest. Vidyaji. I just basically wanted to know if there's 
any other any other message or anything else both the food like to convey through this uh, uh, session uh, geeta ma'am and uh, madam shoji is there, is there anything else that you know you would like to convey please go ahead i think uh, first of all thank you so much uh, ravi shankar ji and uh, with the ma'am uh, bringing this satamava uh, jayate platform and this satamava uh, jayate itself uh, the speak out Uh, and this is the the hope today uh, the meeting is having that the the, the truth should prevail and the justice will, should be given to the meeting and uh, through this platform what we would like to uh, request to the the audiences or the people in the mainland of uh, the india that they should know what is the truth they should not just go with the hypes and they should not just go to the religious sentiment because uh, uh for for me there is no second home uh for this uh, chinpuki people they have already home in myanmar uh, they are quite powerful and uh, in fact in a in a country like myanmar they are representing two mps there and uh they the 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 god should bring a good spirit to them they should i mean uh, understand that what is humanity and uh, this kind of uh, uh, aggression and uh, this this should not definitely should not bring should not bring a a goodwill to them because in today's world no one can live in isolation no one can live isolation and if the world comes to know that this is the one community and they are with the kind of the ill minded and uh, and definitely against the the humanity definitely no one is Uh, going to appreciate them no one is going to uh, invite them so they they should earn they should learn this and they should know this and uh, before it goes uh, very late to them and uh, it's uh, the prayers to the my the my people who are suffering uh, it should give them the, the the enough power to you know there are people who are it's a harvesting period you see that there are people who went to the field the agriculture field to plow but uh, they have been uh, shot by the kuki people and fired upon them uh, with the firearms and they could not and this is the harvest pe- harvesting time and those people the farmers and uh, people who are in the relief camp mostly they are the farmers and you could see that kind of the the kind of the agony the mental agony they must be having it's already been one and a half year and we want to pray to the government the central government or us to the government that enough is enough the time has come they should take the the proper action thank you from my side yeah uh, thank you navakishor ji i echo whatever navakishor ji has said we, sh- we we like to appeal to the people of the mainland also to uh, you know not view the social media news as it is like uh, the the drone bombing uh, which happened in kotrug and the missiles immediately after in the social media it was portrayed as maitai people bombing and cookies being killed you know there there has been no victim of cookies but in the social media it was spread like that ready for uh, for you know the news to be spread like that huh? so those people who are consuming the social media in uh, contents they will believe that so ultimately of course with investigation and the truth facts on the ground coming out it was revealed satya me vijayate we believe the truth will eventually prevail this is the hope i have and uh, it does come out and so i would appeal to the uh, listeners especially for the from the mainland indian uh, subcontinent people living there not to you know actually uh, believe entirely what is being portrayed because we believe media contents are made ready before the events even happened and uh, to better analyze after hearing both sides and i would like to appeal to the people of manipur regardless of community to please come out and speak for you know like preserving manipur the integrity of manipur the idea of manipur i know there are many people among kuki communities also who are scared to speak out i do have friends they do write to me but they have no voice they wear voices like uh, ex mp uh, mrs kibgen but once after appearing in the national media and she spoke about peace in favor of maitai's few lines that he have she has friends who helped her next day she disappeared from the national media so these kind of voices have been suppressed 
and I appeal for the uh, you know people belonging to the Kuki communities who like to have peace, who like to live harmoniously with other communities because there is no other way out. You cannot live separated, segregated out from the world. So ultimately, we have to live together, and you know we are one people in a way. You know we noticed. I am sure Vidyaji and Ravi Shankarji will agree. When you see us, you cannot say you are Meite, you are Kuki, you are Naga. We look, I mean, we are one. We are speaking different language or dialects. But ultimately, humanity should prevent. You cannot continue killing each other. It's not possible to totally wipe out Meites. It's not possible to totally wipe out Kukis. It doesn't work like that. You know, so uh, I hope better sense prevails and the voices which are uh, you know, scared to coming out, uh, talking about peace, uh, you know, talking about peace and settlement, they should combine and become a force if they want Manipur to be intact. This is my appeal to the people of Manipur. And to my days, I would uh, appeal that to remain hopeful, to work together and, you know, make our voice loud and clear to the center. In the central government, I would appeal to please take the powers in your hand which you are having you know, state government doesn't have any power right now. The central government is taking full power of the uh, law and order even. So to please use this power, you know, to protect the lives and property of the citizens, to truly bring about peace in the state, not by talking to one community separately and another community separately, because then it creates distrust. You can force them force the leaders because the leaders falls, uh, belong to the same party, the BJP party. We force them to come together and sit. So if the center has the intention, it has all the means to bring about peace in the state. And I do appeal to the central leaders to please, uh, you know, as fast as possible before the situation worsens, work towards this line. Thank you, Vidyaji. Thank you, Ravis. Thank you, Gitaji. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Deji and uh, Navagishorji, that uh, you know, we, we hope uh, the violence in Manipur subsides soon and uh, all the anti-India, uh, the divisionary forces are all thwarted uh, from the territory and peace prevails in the region. And I uh, wish we, we will extend all our support and uh, we wish uh, success in your efforts. Thank you very much for having a, this conversation with us. Yeah, and I I would like to go one step further, uh, Gita Ji and Napakishor Ji. I am praying that there will soon come a time where you would you wouldn't see yourself separate from mainland India. You are part of India only. You are very much, you know, we are all together in this. So you know, you are uh, as precious as the other parts of India. So you are not separate from us. So I am so grateful to both of you for taking your time out and joining us on this platform. And I would request you to come further for other sessions also in case you have anything else to speak on, we are more than happy to host you. So thank you so much for spending your precious time with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All the very best in all your efforts. Thank you so much. Thank you.